Hello, everybody, and welcome to Communication Nation. As you may know, our mission on this podcast is to help you build powerful communication skills so that you can more effectively push your mission forward in the world. I'm your host, Brett McDermott, and I'm completely obsessed with discovering and implementing the tactics used by today's most charismatic and effective communicators. Uh, today's guest is Rob Biesenbach, and I bought him on the show today to answer the question, how do we all become better storytellers? Rob is the author of the best-selling book, Unleash the Power of Storytelling. Rob, thank you for being on the show today, my man. My pleasure, Brett. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. And I'm pumped up to just kind of chat with you here about the art of storytelling. I'm, I'm going to start us off with, with a quote. The most powerful person in the world is a storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, the values and agenda of an entire generation that is to come. And that's a quote from Steve Jobs. And I just want to ask you, why do you think storytelling is so important? Well, at first I was a little worried. I was like, that, that doesn't sound like me. I thought you were quoting me. Okay, so Steve Jobs, much, much more authoritative. So, uh, now, again, the question was, why are storytelling, storytelling yeah, wh so powerful? Why is this a, a skill that any of us need to put time and effort into improving? Well, there's a ton of science behind the power of storytelling, hard science, neuroscience that stories have a unique effect on our brains that our, our brains are storytelling machines they, they 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 take all these various inputs that are bombarding us all day and try to put them into a framework based on our background our experience our beliefs our expectations our values and so many other things um so there's, there's a ton of science behind it. It, it causes our brain to uh, release chemicals that make us more cooperative, make us more persuadable. Uh, so yeah, storytelling is the way to go. If you want to persuade somebody of something, story is the way to do it. And we all do. I'd say yeah. most people, I'd say pretty much everyone listening at the end of the day is certainly trying to sell something, persuade someone to, 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 to act in, in a certain way. Uh, and let's just you know start with your, your, your story a little bit, right? Your, your journey kind of started with all this when you signed up for some improv and sketch classes a long time ago. And, you know, somewhere along the way, you learned that you kind of had a knack for this storytelling thing. You know, now you write books, you give speeches, you teach wor workshops for some of the biggest companies in the world on the art form of storytelling. And, uh, you know, at what point did you realize that, that storytelling was a passion of yours? Well, I think it started even before Second City. I was, uh, I did a lot of things. I was in PR and communications. I specialized mm -hmm. in executive speech writing, and I found mm -hmm. that I had a knack for weaving a speech for a major executive, which is not something that everybody can do. And a big part of that was finding really the music of the speech, the rhythm, the cadence, and capturing the voice of the speaker and threading these concepts together into a cohesive narrative and, and bringing some emotion forward. So that was the kernel of it, but you know, Second City was like rocket fuel that really took off after that. Sure, sure. And, and you know, like you said, it, maybe it is something that, that originally came naturally to you that you've really built upon uh, over the years. But for some people, and self-included, you know, storytelling, not necessarily uh, an innate skill uh, of myself. And I think we all know two or three people that are just born storytellers. And, and they've just been sitting at the dinner table, captivating everyone for their entire lives. I know my father's one of those people. He's an incredible storyteller. I'm sure he never read a book on storytelling. He just knows how to do it. But what about the rest of us that aren't born storytellers? And when we're telling the story, we've got a little anxiety in our chest of, is this going to land? Are we going to get any laughs? And you almost kind of are hoping to get to the end of it and just finish it because most of your stories don't land the way you want them to. You know, what do you say to someone who's just not a natural storyteller? Like, how do they progress in, in this world? I, I think that anxiety that a lot of people have around storytelling, it, it, comes from, it comes from movies and TV and Oprah and TED Talks. It's this feeling that, Oh, a story. If I don't knock people out of their chairs, send them into gales of laughter, reduce them to tears, it's not a story. It's not a good story. And so I, I really tell people, you know, just lower the bar. 
Sure. A story is simply, uh, it's really a glorified example. I mean, when I talk to a client and I'm trying to dig stories out of them, I don't say, well, do you have a story about that? I, I say, have you ever experienced something like that before? Or tell me about this big challenge you're facing. So a story is really about a character going through some kind of challenge and overcoming that challenge. And that's, it's pretty simple. Right. Don't psych yourself out to, too much. Yeah. I, I, I hear you. I know we are, are those the, the general kind of components of, of any story, kind of the, the, the three that you just went over there, or is there a little bit more to it? Yeah. It's, I mean, I use like, I guess 3.5. It's a, a character. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. A character has a goal, but there's some challenge or obstacle uh, that prevents them from achieving that goal. And then it resolves in some way. So okay. that's, generally the flow of a good story but i mean to really bring it down it's all it's all about character conflict and resolution something something has to happen if there's no sure. conflict and there's no story right right so if the there's character, no character it's hard to find a story yeah correct correct now do you think it's important when you're telling any story kind of to tell it from your point of view and talk about the emotions that that you experienced you know during the story like maybe it's not necessarily about you it's about your friends but you kind of talk about the emotions you experienced while watching whatever happened. Is that part of the, the science here? Just talking about the emotions that you felt in the moment? I don't know if it's about talking about the emotions so much as showing them. I mean, the story is mm -hmm. all about show, don't tell. Um, so it's ideally if you're telling a story and you have some emotional connection to it, and it doesn't, again, have to be like a heartbreaking emotion, uh, but some level of passion or sadness or frustration or impatience or whatever the, the, this, the emotion is at work that ought to be exhibited through the story. Sure. In your behavior. And how about like, just kind of like setting, I guess, like the, the scene for, for a story. Do, do you try and like talk about like, you know, the time period, like exactly where it was before you kind of go into the nuts and bolts of the story, like kind of paint a picture of, uh, of the atmosphere first. Sometimes, I mean, for really sophisticated stories, you mm -hmm. might want to get deep into that. I, I think it's really you just need to set the time and the place and the circumstance. Um, it's I'll, I'll never forget my first job interview. Uh, I was sitting across the desk, you know, so that's, that's really about right. as much as you need. But it, right. there could be bigger descriptors, the farther away it is from people's everyday experience. Mm -hmm. You know, I was trudging through this rainforest in Brazil. It was a hundred degrees, sweat was dripping off of me. There were snakes draped from the trees. My, my boots were stuck in the, in the muck. I mean, that, that might lend a little more atmosphere to it. Sure. Sure. I, I, absolutely. I think those are great tips. What, when, you know, when you're, you really, you know, just kind of like gave us a few details of like what was going on exactly during the story. Like when you're telling a story, whether it's to a workshop or just at the dinner table, do you try and like go there in your own mind and really see the story like as you're telling it? Is that, is that part of being a great storyteller is the ability to kind of go there in your mind's eye while you're telling the story? Yeah, I, I think so. You have to be, you have to relive that moment because that's really how you get part of the emotional res resonance and you know emotion is critical to story emotion is critical mm -hmm. to to uh, persuasion mm -hmm. so as much as you can you know not detach yourself from it but actually feel the things that you were feeling i mean I, i'm working on a presentation right now for a client and uh they're in the education field and i talk about uh the night before we sent our first child off to daycare and, you know, I was heartbroken that he's taking this, 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 this baby, this, this infant that sure. depends entirely on us for his care for months. We've just spending with him and now we're going to turn him over to like total strangers. And you know, what, you know, what was he going to be thinking? What would, you know, how was he going to be treated? Just, so yeah, you, you have to, that's a little bit of the performance aspect of storytelling. You have to be feeling it. 
you got to feel it. You got to go there in your mind's eye. I think for, for myself, sometimes I'm, I'm so consumed with like looking at my audience and, you know, so in tune to, are they responding? Are they not responding? But sometimes I, I won't be as in my mind's eye in the story as I should be because I'm too concerned with, is my audience reacting to me in this moment? And I feel like that's that's not where you want to be. You don't want to necessarily be, you know, watching your audience and hoping they react. You just got to go there. You got to go where that story is in your mind's eye. And that's how you'll recount details and tell it in a more natural sense. Yeah, that, that, that can be difficult. It can be disconcerting. Um, to, and it can bring you out of the story. So For sure. <clears throat> especially then, so again, if it has a, some emotional resonance with you, and I think those are the best kind of stories to tell, then ideally you can't help but be caught up in it. You know, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I guess, again, for someone who's listening to this and, you know, self-included that don't really consider themselves like a master storyteller that can just, you know, tell a story of something that happened years ago for the first time at a dinner table and feel confident in, in that story landing. Do you ever recommend people just kind of practicing and knowing by heart, you know, two, three, four key stories, almost like create a vault for, for themselves of like some go-to stories that they feel comfortable with. Yeah. Everybody should have like a story bank. Okay. Um, and I recommend people do really, uh, they call it an inventory or an audit. I've been calling it an audit, but that has a real negative connotation, but it's whatever your occupation is, whoever you're serving, whether you're people within your organization, customers, clients, mm -hmm. board members, you think about what are their biggest problems, issues, concerns, you make a list. And then you, in the second column, you think about, okay, have I experienced these problems, issues my, myself or sure. seen them? Uh, and then you start to craft your stories and ideally, yeah, you should have a bank of stories for the big issues that come up a lot in your work. I like that. Yeah, have a bank, have a vault. Do you recommend people, you know, before telling them, <coughs> per perhaps type them out, you know, write them out to really kind of like have it all out in front of you? If that helps, uh, I think it's more useful just to internalize them, uh, just to, to, to think it over, to listen to it in their head. Or say it out, try it out loud. Yeah. But whatever helps people, if it helps them to document them, um, you know, if you want to keep track of all your stories, keep a spreadsheet, that's sure. fine. But um, I have a lot of stories uh, and most of them just come to me oh, unless I've already documented them in my book or something. Sure, sure. Okay. So I think that's great advice, though. If you're just getting started in the storytelling game, you know, have two or three in the bank that you really master that you're comfortable with. And then once you, you get more comfortable telling those in public settings, you'll probably more, just naturally start telling other stories off the cuff. I think that's that is really good advice. Yeah. I kind of want to like delve into like the, the performance aspect of telling a great story. You know, is there anything that, that you try and teach as far as like, you know, how much eye contact should we make when telling a story with our audience is vocal variety and inserting pauses, speaking slowly, speaking quickly, like any just performance aspects that, that you'd like to touch on as far as just, you know, telling a sound story. Yeah. I mean, everybody has, a different style. And again, sure. I think people ought to go where the emotion takes them and they ought to be as natural as possible. But yeah, it is good to vary your pace, you know, to speed up as you get to the, the climax mm -hmm. of a big story, to slow it down, to pause occasionally when, you know, and then the thing I least expected happened. Right. And, you know, so add a little drama to it, move around, gesture, walk around. If you're, if you're on a stage, walk around. Um, but um, you just go where your emotions naturally take you. Is, that's what I say. For sure. And do you, do you make any type of, you know, um, uh, point to, of making eye contact with your audience? Or is that just something that, you know, make as much as you're comfortable with? Yeah. I mean, you have to, I think you have to make mm -hmm. eye contact with your audience. And, and you know, when I'm, what I've been speaking about to this point is really about everyday 
storytellers, individuals. Right. I would probably counsel something a little different and certainly more sophisticated for uh, professional speakers for sure. who make their living speaking. But I, my main business, I don't work with, prof I'm, you know, I, I, I'm a member of the National Speakers Association, but I don't get my business from professional speakers. Sure. I'd rather, which I like them. I'm one of them, but I, I help. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more interested in helping the everyday manager or executive or whoever it might be. Right, yeah. Their way through the workplace and the marketplace. So 100%. So that, that's where most of my counsel has been coming from. But yeah, yeah. if it's a, on a higher level, there'd be a lot more art and performance to it. For sure. But I, but I just I, got off know. track of where I was going, but. No worries. I mean, you gave some great tips there. I really like, you know, the, make some gestures. I like the idea of kind of, you know, speeding up your, your tone and then slowing it down depending on where you are in the story. I think that just kind of like varying the speed of, of your tonality will, will certainly keep people engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything else that, that you kind of like to uh, hit on you know, when you're teaching clients as far as just like, just general things we can do to make our stories more engaging? Yeah, well, I think uh, it's kind of a contradiction because uh, it's not just, what goes in that, that makes a great story is what you mm. leave out. So on one hand, you have to cut a lot of the extraneous details that don't add to the story. On the other hand, certain details can really elevate a story and give it its power. Mm -hmm. um, I was working with an executive for, she was with an organization, leading an organization, and she said, uh, things were going really well, it was clicking in all cylinders, and then suddenly, you know, revenue started to trail off, and then we started to get into trouble, and then we had to, like, lay off some people. And so we instituted this turnaround strategy. I said, wait, 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 <laughs> back up. It's all very general. Was there a moment when you realized that things were going south? Mm -hmm. And, of course, there are several moments, but... You know, we explored them and we picked one. It happened to be a particular meeting where they, they were with a prospect and they could, she realized that the person was glazing over because she and her team were talking at the person and not with them. They were just lecturing them. They're telling them stuff as opposed to finding out what that person wanted and how they could serve them. Sure. So sure. Absolutely. There has to be those little moments. That's what, especially where the stories turn. Now, mm -hmm. whether it was Tuesday at 3.45 p.m. or Wednesday at 1.15 p.m., those are, those are details that aren't really relevant. Doesn't matter. That's um, not going to really keep, people, keep people's attention for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the details that put you in the time or place or some kind of sensory detail. You know, I... I, I I told her the price and there was a long pause and a bead of sweat ran down my back and she said, sounds good. You know, so, so the sights, sounds, experiences, feelings are good ways to go when it comes to detail. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. And, and one thing you also did there was you kind of recounted some of the dialogue that went down in that story, right? You, you kind of recounted what, exactly what you said to her. Do you think that's an important, yeah. you know, piece of the puzzle is like, is actually kind of quoting like one or two pieces of, of real dialogue that happened during the story? Yeah, I didn't really realize I was doing it because I, I tell a lot of stories about stories. So, uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's, it's like the, you know, the, the, we've got so many layers going on here, but, yeah. but, but I, I think that does kind of at least bring me more in when someone's really recounting actual dialogue that happened in the story. Yeah. Well, we, yeah, we, I was talking about the importance of moments. Right. And I told you about a moment where that became really clear to a client. And so wait, sure. back up. <laughs> Tell me about what there's. So it's a, uh, we're very, we're, we're really going down a rabbit hole here, but yeah. And I, I try to, yeah. Dialogue can help. I don't, um, you know, I don't worry if they're the very, you know, the exact precise of course. words, but getting across what was said. The meaning 100%. of it all is important. A hundred percent. Absolutely. And listen, rabbit holes is what we do here on Communication Nation. So I'm, I'm happy that, that we're doing it the right way. Yeah. <laughs> and, and again, for, for some of us that aren't the most comfortable or natural storytellers, and we're just kind of, you know, get, getting our feet wet, getting comfortable here. You know, how long should a story be? 
as long as it takes to make your point. Yeah. You know, that's a, not a great answer, but I'll, I'll say, um, you know, I, I watched Malcolm Gladwell one time in a ballroom tell an hour long story or something. I mean, it must've been an hour. I mean, sure. he weaved it over the course of his speech and it was a magnificent, but most of us aren't Malcolm Gladwell. Not yet. And not yet. Live, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. We live in a, <laughs> in a, in a, an attention scarce economy. Mm-hmm. And so I generally believe, uh, the shorter, the better, the shorter, the safer, especially if maybe you're not completely comfortable as a storyteller. Right. So I think that's good. a couple I, of minutes, one or two set. minutes. One or two minutes at the beginning, as you get more comfortable, maybe you build it up, you know, three, four or five minutes. But I do think in the beginning, you know, keep it short and sweet, you know, maybe go to uh, every party or gathering with the goal of just, you know, just telling one story if it's scary for you and just kind of break the ice and just write it down in your to do list or your notes app and say, like, my goal for this party is to tell one two minute story, the one that I kind of worked on a little bit before I came. And mm-hmm. I just think, you know, that's just the, the way that we get better at things It's slow and steady, but we have to have intent and we have to get out there on the playground and we got to actually play. And, and I think that, you know, just telling that one or two minute story in the beginning is a good way to kind of get us comfortable with it. Um, yeah. How about being funny in stories? I mean, that that's probably the scariest thing about a story is, is if you've got a few points in it or the intent of the story is to make your audience laugh and just having that anxiety in your belly, like, is this joke going to hit or is it not? You know, just, yeah. how, how do we be funny in stories or is it something that we shouldn't even be worrying about? And, and if the laughs come, they come. If they don't, they don't. Yeah, I think if... Your goal shouldn't necessarily be to make people laugh. Your goal mm-hmm. should be to convince them of something, uh, to connect with them, to get them thinking in a different way, whatever your, your actual substantive goal is. If you let go of, because most of us aren't great joke tellers. I'm not really a great joke teller. I can never remember jokes. But there's all kinds of humor that can be found in the moment because life mm-hmm. is funny. People are funny naturally without trying to be funny. Right. So I, I look more for those spontaneous found moments. And, and again, there are professionals out there, the raconteurs who can really weave a great story with a punchline that, that hits just right. But for most of us mere mortals, I yeah. think we're, we're better off just letting the, the humor happen naturally. And if it doesn't happen, that's okay too. It can still be a good story without laughter. Like that is possible. Sure. Um, and I think, you know, one part of the story that gives people probably the most anxiety of all is the ending, right? Is mm-hmm. we don't want to be like that babbling incoherent person that just kind of like mumbles themselves off to sleep. And that's how the story ends. And then the topic changes and everyone's like, well, you know, that was awkward. Uh, yeah. it, it, you know, <laughs> it, it, is there an art form to ending a story or, or some things that, that we should have in yeah. mind here? End, endings are hard in stories and in life and everything else. Uh-huh. <laughs> It was one thing I call it like the Malcolm Gladwell method. I mean, he didn't make it up. Uh, it's basic journalism, but I encourage people if they want to know how to tell a story, read some of his books. And, you know, there's a, there's, this is one of the things I talk about in my talks is uh, in Tipping Point, there is a chapter on connectors, mavens and networkers or something mm-hmm. like that. And he starts really small. He goes small, gets big and goes small again. So he starts small talking about, you know, 1780 something or other. And this young stable boy overhears a conversation, a British uh, um, colonel saying there's going to be hell to pay tomorrow. And this kid runs off to his friend, Paul Revere, and tells him. And then subsequently what we get is Paul Revere's ride. Uh, And... Gladwell starts with that small detail and uses it to make the point that Paul Revere was very successful versus another person, William Dawes, who went out that same night on a different route. William, like all the people in the countryside remained in their beds when William Dawes rode through town. But when Paul Revere did, he rallied them and you know rallied the defense of the nation. And that was because he had this special skill of being a maven or a connector mm-hmm. uh, where the other guy didn't. And so then for 70 or 80 pages, Gladwell explores this concept. He provides scientific evidence, anecdote, story, explanation, examples. And then at the very end, he comes back to that stable. You know, it all started on a cold morning in Boston, the stable boy. So 
I think it's such a great way to go where you start with a small moment. It could be an object, a person, a moment, a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, focus on that, blow that out to a larger story. But then when you're tr struggling to look, where does this end up? Go back to that moment. I love that. Bring, it. bring it full circle. I think that is that that's a really good structure. Cause I think that's one part of the story is that most people struggle with is, is landing the plane. You know, I mean, yeah. la landing the plane, you could tell a great story that gets laughs and is interesting, but if you don't know how to land the plane, then people are probably not going to remember that as a great story. And that, and that, that's just kind of the fact of it. But I think coming full circle to whatever that moment was in the beginning is really, that's a really good tip. Yeah. Um, wh where do we like, you know, where do we find great stories? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like like wh where in our lives do we find these interesting tales that we're going to tell at the dinner table? I mean, they're, they're all around us. I mean, we tell stories all the time. One of the things I do in my workshops is like, if it's, <clears throat> September, I, I said, get up, share with somebody your favorite memory from this summer, or if mm -hmm. it's after the holidays, what's your favorite thing you did over the holidays? Uh, what's the greatest, what's the best movie you saw? And what people are doing is they're telling stories and they naturally find a way to tell them. So stories are, we see stories unfold in traffic. They unfold in the Starbucks line. They unfold around the house and in the workplace in things we read, listen to, they're everywhere. You just have to be, and I think the key is, again, going back to this story audit, is knowing what you're about. Like I'm always on the lookout. I'm not looking out for stories on how to be a better fisherman. Right. <laughs> I'm, looking out, <laughs> I'm looking out for stories on the power of emotion or the power of storytelling or, how to uh, break down walls with an audience, uh, all of those things. So I'm just always filtering all the inputs for things like, oh, that's really good. I can use that. And I, I'm finding that I find that all the time and stuff I read and see. Sure. Yeah, I think that I think that that's a good way of looking at it. It's just know what filter you're looking at the world from. You know, what are you all about? What are the stories that you're going to be able to tell most effectively in whatever settings you find yourself in? most commonly and then just look at the world through that filter who knows maybe open up an app on your phone and just kind of keep a running list of, of the ideas that you have that might turn into really good stories i, I think helps, it, yeah. it, 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 i think that could help some people and then as far as just like practicing this skill is this should we be out here trying to tell like a story a day or a story a week or like how do we actually get out there and practice stories and, and become better well uh, you, I like your idea of going to parties. I mean, that's a really competitive environment because at a party, everybody's like, you know, there's so much stimuli, people, that horrible thing where you're talking to somebody and they're looking over your shoulder. It's, you know, there's somebody else to go. So that's, that's it's an awful thing. feeling. It's an, and we've all been there. I mean, maybe not you, but I know I've been no, there. I, I I've, I've certainly been, you know, been in the process of telling a story to like two or three people and I can tell it's not landing and they want to talk to the guy over here who's probably telling a better story. It's not, it's not fun. <laughs> it's yeah. really not. So yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's one way that I hadn't thought of, but that's a high pressure environment. Toastmasters, a lot of people enjoy Toastmasters. It's a great yeah. way to work on your stories and also be inspired by other stories in the way they tell them. Um, and I imagine there's, there's probably, there's probably story group somewhere. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I did a, um, a storytelling uh, live class with a storyteller storytelling teacher here in New York city. His name's Adam Wade. Um, and it was like a, like a six week kind of workshop thing. And, and you had, you had to build out a few stories over the course of the six weeks. And then eventually they had you perform a story in front of everyone's family and friends at a small theater. Um, and that was almost just like a storytelling boot camp. And I, I will say after that certainly felt a, a little more comfortable, you know, telling stories at, at a dinner table, I think throwing yourself in the fire, immersing yourself in something like that, which is pretty scary, mm -hmm. it, it, it is a good way, though, to really kind of improve your skills quickly. Um, yeah. 
And if that's not really, you know, uh, your slice of pie, then yeah, I think just kind of going out every day, whether it's with a friend or with your mother and, and just start telling stories, try and tell a story a day, try and tell a couple stories a week, whatever you're comfortable with. Cause the only way to get better at anything is by getting your hands dirty and actually doing it. I mean, you, you can listen to this podcast, you can listen to your workshops, but until you get out there and start telling stories, you're probably, you're probably not going to become a, a better storyteller, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. What are some of the, the biggest mistakes that you commonly see in general with storytelling? Like the, maybe the one or two th or things that, that you see all the time where you're like, got to stop doing that. You know, that's not working. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll say, say two big ones is uh, Googling for stories. Uh, okay. There's, there's a lot of professional speakers who tell age old stories. Some of them not even true. <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know it's like it's like repeating a facebook meme or something it's it's right. not it's, it's not, not your original story. yeah it's not your story it's inauthentic and um you know the best stories are the ones that we've practiced that we've uh actually witnessed or taken part in or at least you know that have experienced so i'd say that's the first one tell original stories sure tell your own uh, and the second one is focus. Focus is hard. You know, this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. And right. it was somebody, I forgot who said this. I think it might've been David Mamet. He, he wrote a great memo to writers of the unit when he was head writer of that. He said, you know, the way things should unfold is this happened. So that happened, this happened, but that happened. So it's constant action consequence, action mm -hmm. consequence, not just all these layers of a cake. This happened and this happened and this happened because we've all right. heard those stories. Really. And then this happened, this happened. It's not telling us anything new. It's not going anywhere. It's painful. I, that is really, I think that that's really helpful though, right? As opposed to just like recounting a series of events, it's an event. And then there was a consequence. Something happens because of that event. And then that brings us over here. We can speak about another action and then a consequence. I think that can help a lot of people that kind of get caught in, in the layering cake of, you know, actions or this happened and this happened and this happened. We've all heard that story. It's not a good story. You need some consequences in there. Um, yeah. yeah, that, that, that that's right. How do we kind of well, actually one thing you touched on there was, of course, you know, a totally fake story that has nothing to do with you. Of course, we're not going to advise. What about telling like a small white lie or a fib or, you know, tweaking the truth a little bit in the story? Is that something that you advise against or, 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 or do you think that we all do that a little bit naturally and that's OK? Yeah, there was a great piece written, I think, by Matthew Dix called The Four Lies of Storytelling. You know, lies. Mm -hmm. uh, it's totally legitimate to tell a story maybe out of sequence um, to, uh, distill multiple characters into one like archetypal character. Um, and to, I forgot all four of them, but the, 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 the mother of all storytelling lies is omission. Omission <laughs> is not a lie. If it's, if that fact is not relevant to mm -hmm. your story. Um, and so like turning points, Life doesn't happen, doesn't unfold like a Hollywood movie where it's just like a lightning flash and everything changes. Life happens in increments. It's just like, you know, we make progress like this. And so when you're telling a story, you don't have to hit every one of those milestones on your way to this big revelation or turning point. Pick one or pick two, even if that one is not necessarily the most, the, the biggest moment in the story or the most important one. If it makes for the best story, then that's the right point to focus on. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, and I think um, you know, uh, omission is something that that we could all do a little bit more of, as opposed to recounting every single detail of everything that happened in the story. I think you know, cutting the fat, getting to the point, decluttering our stories can sometimes be the best thing we can do to become effective storytellers. Um, I think that is a really, really good tip there. Anything we can do just kind of like mindfully to declutter our stories, or is it just kind of, uh, just like a general concept that we should keep in mind? Um, yeah, you know, I use various devices. I tell people to picture a tree and you're telling a story, you want to stick to the trunk and the farther you go out on the branches or the tangents, the, the, the farther you get away from the point of your story. So just right. Follow it from the roots to the top of the tree and don't get stranded out in the, on all these tangents 
it, it's really just an enormous discipline, especially if you're just doing it in the moment. You think of this and, oh, this is interesting. This is a little side note. And that's, a, but those are all just incidental, incidental. They're coincidences. They're, they're not honing in on the core of what the store is about. Right. I think you kind of always have to internalize before you tell it, like, you know, what is the story about? Because that, that'll kind of be your North Star, your compass of like, okay, we got to stay right here because this is what the story is about. It's, you know, right in the center of, of the trunk of this tree. Because if you don't really know what your story is about, then you're going to go off on all those tangents and everyone's going to be like, okay, I don't know what the hell this guy's even talking about. So I, I think that that's a really kind of good way of looking at it. Know the point of your story and try not to veer too far off of that central point. Yeah. And that's what, you know, when filmmakers, they're always editing, they're always, you know, we see deleted scenes, they cut scenes all the time to try to get the movie to a reasonable amount of time. And one of the biggest reasons they cut a scene is because it doesn't add to the story. They've, we've already made this point. We don't need to make it again. It's been established that this person's life is ruined. We don't need to throw in this other thing. It's already been established. Move on. So if you've established the point, move on to the next point. Love it. Awesome stuff, Rob. Thank you for being on the show today, my man. I, I think anyone that, that's listening is going to take away one or two tangible tips. It's going to allow them to be a more powerful storyteller. You know, where, where can people find you keep up with what you're doing right now? Uh, well, if you can spell my name, you can find me. If it's on there, it's uh, Rob Biesenbach, B-I-E-S-E-N-B-A-C-H. I'm the only one. You can find my website, uh, YouTube channel, uh, and you can find my books, uh, the you know, my, the big book is Unleash the Power of Storytelling and is five years old in the last four years. Each year has sold more than the year before. It's, it's crazy. I think people, um, yeah, people are more into storytelling now than they ever have been. And I think that tra that trajectory is going to keep going up. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you, is. Rob. Thank you. And it must be nice being the only Rob Biesenbach. I got to be honest with you. I'm not the only Brett McDermott. There's there, <laughs> there, there's a famous MMA fighter, Brett McDermott, that that still comes up. Oh, no. Oh, and he's just this big ripped, like hulking dude that's definitely not me. So, I, you know, <laughs> I'll have to do some work before I come up before him in the Google search. Maybe uh, five years from now. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe throw in some initials or like a quote, you know, mad dog, Brett, mad dog, Brett, mad dog. And then, you know, you'd be the only only one. I don't know. Uh, I love it. That's actually, that's actually funny. You said that they used to call me mad dog back in Pee Wee football, but I don't think anyone's called me that. mad, mad dog. And in the last 30 years, Rob Biesenbach, thank you, my friend. And thank you everyone for listening to communication nation. If you'd like to receive one tangible tip on how to be a powerful communicator, click the link in our show notes and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. And we will check you all next week, guys. Take care.